hundreds of youth chanted patriotic songs after military and policemen prevented them from accessing the Independence Square for a highly anticipated convention convened by the New Africa Foundation, which was featuring prominent thought leaders such as Professor P. L. O. Lumumba, Nigeria's Peter Obi and Julius Malema, which faced unexpected cancellation. As the clock ticked past its scheduled 5 p.m. start time, armed military personnel and the police formed a blockade, preventing hundreds of patrons from accessing the venue. With the event's significance to addressing critical challenges in Africa's development, the present question remains, why was the entry denied or why was entry denied these patrons and what implication does this hold for the broader discourse on, on, on this particular convention? Well, speakers at the event are currently about holding a press conference to address the latest development. We'll take you there live, but first let's listen to and the earlier chants by the youth who had earlier thronged the place. While I'm hearing that, well, we're live at the press conference where our correspondent, James Aveji, is there for us. Beloved continent and way forward. To my right, Honorable Peter Obi, same thing, same message. The world at large, they know that Africa's future is in the hands of our youth. So New Africa Foundation specifically requested us to come and address African youth, starting with the youth in Ghana. And from what I'm hearing, the youth had actually come from all over Africa and some came from outside Africa, specifically to hear the message. The message of empowerment, the message about our future, the message about the miseducation of not only our youth, but us as Africans. The message about empowering our children and letting them know that now it is the time for us to do what we must do to take our Africa back. For far too long, we have been lied to. For far too long, we have been miseducated. And so as elders, those of uh, the ones who are sitting with me today, and many others, we understand that we have failed our youth, but we do have a responsibility to make it right. And we do know that with our little wisdom and the energy and the intelligence of our youth, together we can take our Africa in a new direction. That is what we came here to do. And that is what New Africa Foundation has asked us to do. We do know that our leaders cannot lead us on their own. They need all of us. So the message that we were going to deliver to our youth today was the message of hope, the message of resilience, and the message that says the Africa we want can only be built by us for us. And for us to succeed at doing so, we must be united. That the African youth are Africa's future. Without them, there is no future for Africa. And as elders, we have a responsibility to share with them the truth and nothing but the truth. That is the message that we came here to deliver. That is what New Africa Foundation had requested us to do. We may not be at the convention center, but we intend to continue to preach the gospel of truth until we reach the promised land. I have no doubt in my mind that we will get there because Africa, the Africans, the people I like to describe as the beautiful, intelligent, sophisticated, highly adaptable, and totally indestructible human beings, the mothers and fathers of humanity, we will get to the promised land. Woo! And that's why we're here. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Africa, Dr. Arikana, for leading the way. The most objective, fearless, and decisive mother we have known in Africa. 
Before we get to Prof, I'd like to go to your right. Prof, right? Okay, let's have Prof respond to this, and then we can move to your right. Professor Thank you very much. Uh, my good sister, Dr. Arikana, has spoken for me, and I believe for all of us. We came here to Accra, Ghana, to share a message. It's the message of hope. It's the message that Africa needs at this time. And there is no better place in the continent of Africa to begin that message than Accra, Ghana. It is in this Accra, Ghana that the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah almost 67 years ago spoke to the world and told the world that the independence of Ghana meant nothing if the continent of Africa was not free. 67 years later, we were congregating here in Accra in the very same place where the founding fathers and mothers of Ghana congregated to share the message of hope invited as we were by the New Africa Foundation with one single instruction that we have lamented for too long, agonized for too long, and the time is now to organize. That is the innocent message that we came here to deliver and in a manner totally inexplicable to us, we are not at that venue. But is it not the wise to say when the world serves you a lemon, ask not for an orange, make yourself lemonade. We are here therefore to say that the message will be alive and well. And you who are here, young and old, you are the conduit via which we are now telling the world that the journey of hope continues apace, not only within the continent of Africa, which is the mother continent, but to Africans in the diaspora. I have no doubt in my mind that there is a conspiracy of sorts by the elements that it should happen the way it has happened. So this is not an occasion for lamentation. It is an occasion for redoubling our efforts and our presence here in Accra, Ghana. My good friend, Honorable Obi, my dear sister, Dr. Rikana Chihombri Kwao, this is the occasion for which the English word serendipity was created. It is a serendipitous occasion that heralds a great future for the continent of Africa. So that looking forward, a meeting such as this will happen not only here in Accra, Ghana, but I look forward to a meeting such as this taking place in Ouagadougou, in Burkina, taking place in Dhaka, in Senegal, in Nairobi, in Kenya, in Johannesburg, in South Africa, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, because this is about the continent of Africa. And we say this at a time when we know that Africa has promised to herself that we are going to make more intimate our, in, our interaction. This is why the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is headquartered mm. here in Accra, Ghana. This Accra, Ghana is where all Africans of goodwill pay homage because out of this Accra, Ghana, there was a great son, the Usagiefo, 
Kwame Nkrumah shall be well with Accra Ghana. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Nobody says it so with such clarity and courage. Professor Pielo understands both the context and the concept, and it's upon the heritage of people like this that the new Africa will definitely be born, no doubt. Before we go to the question, I want to ask one of the, the most feared man in Nigeria right now, if I would say, <laughs> Mr. Pitobi. Well, after listening to Prof and Doctor, I don't know that I still have anything to contribute to this. But to your question, I have reason for coming to, let me start by thanking the New Africa Foundation for their invitation and organizing this event. And like the previous speakers have said, we might not be at the convention, but that will not stop the conversation. We only shifted venue, so the conversation continues. We're in Ghana to start a conversation about Africa. Africa for too long has suffered, and everybody knows the reason why Africa has, been, has suffered. People can try to present it in different stages. The prof speaks about it every day. Africa has been going through what it's going through because of what I always say is that it is due to one problem, leadership. It is failed leadership over the years that brought Africa where it is. I want to start a conversation because of what Dr. Arikana has said, talking to the youth of Africa, no continent in the world today have the potential of Africa. Not one. We are the second largest in terms of population and size. But our potential is far greater than even number one. Because today, Africa is the only continent that have a population of 1.1 billion youths, energetic, talented, <coughs> ready to leave the world in different areas of the world. Africa is home to the biggest, highest amount of natural resources, from minerals to we have 65% today of the world all cultivated arable land. So imagine what we can do. We can feed the world. We can do everything. But ironically, because of what I started with, failed leadership over the years, Africa is also home to the highest number of poor people. Out of the 700 million people in extreme poverty today, 431 million lives in Africa. Over 30% of our population. If you go to multidimensional poverty, out of 1.1 billion, over 60% is in Africa. With Congo and Nigeria leading. Today, in the surface of the world, Congo has the highest amount of natural, call it minerals, over 24 trillion. Nigeria has similar situation. You can extrapolate Congo situation to all over Africa, where they have everything but they are producing poverty. It cannot continue with our youths. With the energy they have, they can lead the world in technology, in health, in entertainment, in everything. 
All they want is leadership, purposeful leadership. Africa has worries. Look at its wealth, resources, shamelessly stolen and put in private pockets. It cannot continue. So we are just here to continue conversations not about any country, anything, but talking to the youth of Africa to know that the, they can change the world. They can change the way things are in Africa. Africa should not be a continent where people come to beg or plead for aid. We should be contributing to aid of other people with the resources we have. And that's what Africa should be. Their own Africa should be. That's all the conversation is all about. It's about the future of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Peter Obi. And I dare say that the peace, in quote, that is enjoyed in Nigeria today, negative or positive, is responsible for it because he has refused the violent way and it's very good to say it in a place like Ghana. And some of us <coughs> took to the streets. We were willing to bring Nigeria to our knees so that we can rise up again. But he seems to have an ideology and in... The little time I spent with him, I could understand that. America and Europe are all built on genocide. They just wipe out the people and took. So Africa is shaping a completely new definition and dimension. Nigeria sits 600 languages. That is it. I don't know even how to put it. But to manage that diversity, and it's something we will do and we can do, to share something that has never existed in the continent of the world. This is what has been given to us to do. And so I want to thank you, sir, for responding to what you said, because truly it's only leadership that can do that, and you're speaking to the people who will take that. We'll take a few more questions. This is so beautiful happening here today. Please, your name and your question. So, um, my, my name is Kobiche. I'm a Ghanaian blogger. So I'm very excited. First of all, I like the fact that there's no new Ghana Foundation, but it is new Africa Foundation. Now, um, one of our major problems we have in Africa is the illiteracy rate and the mindset of the people. As leaders, how are we going to consciously change the mindset of the people to receive the change that we all demand for? And also make sure that education will be able to go down to every African child. So that as they grow up, their mindset will change, be able to you know, grab the knowledge that everybody wants power wants to, I mean, appeal, appeal to. Mm. Because for instance, if I come to you and I tell you that I'm giving you sugar for you to vote for me, if you are illiterate, the probability of the person convincing you is high. But if you are literate and you know your power, I doubt people will use just mere material things to, to get to you. Thank you. I think that's a very powerful question. Mama, I think you need to respond to that. Yes. That's a very interesting question. And, and I need you guys to pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say. You raised a very important issue that you said, being literate or illiterate. But I'll tell you, our issues as Africans today are issues of the mind. The most dangerous African of today is an African who is colonized, educated or not. Coming from Zimbabwe, I can honestly tell you that the people who are moving Zimbabwe in terms of the awakening are the villagers. They seem to have a better understanding of what is really going on and are less likely to be sold, are less likely to sell their souls. And you must look in, at the people around you. Some of the most difficult people, I, gave a, I was called by the Africa group at the World Bank one time to address them for their annual uh, event. 
And I went through all the issues and the pillars of why Africa is where Africa is. And, and I analyzed the uh, Pact for the Continuation of Colonization that the 14 African former French colonies were made to sign. I thought everybody understood. By the end of it, two African-born economists working for the World Bank come to me and said, but Ambassador, why do you keep talking about the Berlin Conference? It's a thing of the past. And to my utter shock, I'd gone through the process of explaining the Berlin Conference and that it is a policy that was put in place in order to see it with that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominated. And that as long as we have a country called Togo, as long as we have a country called Burkina Faso, as long as we have a country called Malawi, we are defeated. Intentionally so. So these two economists working for the World Bank are the same ones now that are being used as instruments of our own self-destruction. They're the ones that are being sent to Africa to sell policies that are detrimental to Africa's progress. So the question then becomes, what is our education doing for us? And it goes back to the miseducation. The people who are in power are the ones who are failing to stand up and challenge those who are raping us in broad daylight. Pardon my choice of words. I was once asked by one African, Ambassador, let's try to be nice to these Westerners. Let's not be too direct as we challenge them. And I did ask this brother of mine, I said, my brother, help me out. How do I tell a man who is raping me to rape me nicely? I said, help me with the language. <laughs> and this was an educated professor who is advising me to be nice. How long am I going to continue to be nice? Those are the educated people who are sitting in the boardrooms and they choose to be mute. And when they are mute while representing us, that means 1.4 billion Africans are mute. It is not the villager who is sitting at the boardroom table. It is the elite, the educated. So my son, what is our education doing to us? What have we done to undo the colonial education? I hear right here in Ghana, perfect example. There's not a single Kwame Nkrumah book that is required reading in the Ghanaian educational system. Whose problem is that? Most African countries, our educational system is still the colonial educational system. So what do you expect from the leaders that we have today if their education remains colonized? So may I say the most dangerous person for Africa today is a colonized African. And we must challenge each and every one of us to have a serious conversation with the image in the mirror. Are you colonized? Where do you stand when it comes to the issues to do with Africa? How do you feel about the continued exploitation of Africa? How do, how do you feel about neocolonization, imperialism? Do you even understand it? Do you even know what the Berlin Conference means when it comes to your ability to buy bread, to your ability to get a job? Can you connect the dots back to the policies that are designed to keep us where they want us to be? It is the elite, it is the educated who are refusing to challenge the status quo and speak on our behalf educated or not. So I'd like to answer your question by saying our miseducation is what is leading us to the Africa that we are today, an Africa that cannot stand up and defend our turf with facts, with our truths. Ours is a simple issue. You see, truths and facts, 
These are constants that never change. All we got to do is stand up. I'd like to end by saying, some of you have seen a poster. There were black men who were bending over, and there was a table about on their backs. And at the bottom, it simply said, and on top, of course, sitting around the table, were white people who were feasting. And the caption simply said, all we got to do is stand up. Why have we failed to stand up? At this point, I want to say that um, while we bring this convention, this conversation, this press conference to a close, I want to demand on your wisdom, both of you, Prof, beginning from you, to look at the issues and give a closing remark. And I believe I can trust that once that is done from both of you, we can bring this to a close perfectly. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. When I uh, several months ago received a phone call from a young African, Nana Freedom Bediako, inviting me and others to this conference. This is what he told me in summary. Africa needs to speak about hope to our young sons and daughters. And that hope must not be based on sentimentalism or romanticism. It must be grounded on things that can change the lives of young Africans. It must be about what we can do in order to improve our agriculture, in order to add value to our resources, in order to give meaning to the things that will change people's lives. When I arrived in Accra, Ghana, yesterday, the sixth day of January, the year 2024, that young man, Nana Bediako, took us to a room and gave a demonstration of what him and his foundation think about African solution to African problems how we can use our human and natural resources to change our circumstances so that we can be beggars no more. We were touched. And you who are present here, you who are journalists, who will give the oxygen of publicity to what we are saying here today. I want to tell you that Africa will only change and change for the better when our young men and women embrace that spirit, the spirit of personal sacrifice for the general good. It is not a journey for the faint-hearted. In that journey, you will have many hurdles, but when you face a hurdle, use it as a ladder. In that journey, you will cross many rivers. And when you cross one river, there will be many more rivers to cross. In that journey, you may climb and will climb many mountains. When you climb one mountain, there'll be more mountains to be climbed. And when I ask that young man, Nana Bediako, why new dawn? He says there have been many dawns, but this is a new one with a new meaning and a new resolve. We'll begin to leave Accra, Ghana, physically, 
But Accra, Ghana is our true emotional and intellectual north for Pan-Africanism. We'll come here again and again. If only to energize ourselves about which, that was, which is good and right for the continent of Africa. Africa will rise. And this struggle for Africa is an intergenerational struggle. The baton that we now wield will be passed from generation to generation. Nana Bediako. Go forth with your new dawn Go forth. in the knowledge that fortunes favors the persistent, the patient, and the vigilant shall be well with you. Mm. Let's take it to Mr. Peter B. as he gives his closing remark. so much, Professor. Always igniting the fire in us. And I'll join Prof in encouraging you to persevere on what you started. Like Prof said, whatever we came whatever happened today is not the ending. For me, it's the ending of the beginning. We just began the journey. Prophet said where he wants us to take this conversation to in different parts of Africa. And I think we should do that. And I've listened to my dear sister talk about education. I've always maintained consistently the problem of Africa, like Chinua Achebe said and Prof says every day, is squarely failure of leadership. It is failure of African leaders rising up to their responsibility that is keeping Africa where Africa is today, a continent of immense hope and resources. The only way to resource state and keep that hope is by having competent leadership. A leadership that means well. That is the only way to make a difference. As long as we continue hiring wrongly, as long as we continue having incompetent people who don't have capacity, we will remain where we are. To change that hope for the youth is to know that it requires sacrifice and everything. We talked about education. Yes, I agree with my dear sister that on issue of a colonized, educated, Whatever it is. But what are the leadership today doing in terms of investing in those critical areas? I was just talking to Dr. Morgan this evening, and I said to them, You don't, yes, it's good when people, and that's not the I argue that with you. It's good to blame others for our problem. I don't believe in blaming anybody for my problem. I deal with the problem. We are dealing this evening. In my country, the, to this year's budget is we need, if there's anything Nigeria needs, is human capital. Because that's what will drive our HDI. We have very low human capital. In HDI, we're 158 over 180 countries measured. So we need to invest in education. What we are providing for tertiary institution scholarship, five billion, 
in our budget. And we have six billion to do car park for legislators. <laughs> is, is, that, is, is, that a, is that because of colonialism? So let's talk about our own this. You know, so, so this is the way we start. We don't have a national library. As a country, the number one country in Africa, our national country library was awarded in 1995, and it's being built to today. But our legislators are providing three billion to buy books for their own library. This is not the issue of colonialism. It is the issue I want us to start dealing with our problem. I don't believe that at this stage, anybody is the problem of Africa, except Africans themselves. And I want the youth to start dealing with the issue head on. And that's where I stand. I don't believe I've traveled all over the world. I'm, by infinite message of God, I've been, with my own background as a trader, passed through certain schools where I claim not being a professor, not being a doctor, but I claim to be an alumnus of some good schools. And I said to them, I don't believe there's any white man, there's any yellow man, there's any red man who is more intelligent than I am, or any African is. Mm. We are children, we can compete. Africans can compete with anybody and do better. But we need this fair leadership to give way so that we can start facing the world on the same terms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is such a, a balance to the context of conversation tonight, if you agree with me. Mr. Bitobi, thank you so much one more time. Uh, this is very important at this juncture before I, I bring up, um, just for a closing remark, can you put the chair here for me? 500 years before slavery, it was Ibn Khaldun, an Arab philosopher, an archaeologist, many carried many bags, who said that the Africans were less than human. A hundred years later, John Knox, an English philosopher, also, and I can recount about five not beer parlor people, science and religious leaders from the West who pronounced before the slave trade took place. It began with a conversation. And freedom, as you come up today, and as rightly stated, there has been conversation about Africa, there has been all kinds of stuff, but I can assure you that there hasn't been anything like the conversation we've had today. There hasn't been because there's a new energy and a new spirit in Africa in this room resident here. And so, I know, because three weeks ago, as I walked through the Martin Luther King Center and looking through the history as I was talking to my mentor, that it took 82 years for the black people to recover their voting rights. And yes, here in Africa, it took 87 years from when ANC was formed to when Mandela became president for apartheid to be killed. And yes, Julius Malema fighting for the economic right of South Africa. Africa, with this foundation, and with you, freedom, we shall see in you, Africa. Come on, put your hands together for freedom. Yeah. I grew up in a farmland somewhere in Ghana, in Kumasi. And I was birthed by a woman who is a spiritualist. And she raised me on a farmland. But she raised me with the fear of the Lord. And she gave me a capital 
The capital was the advice she gave me. She said, son, learn how to give to the world, and the world will always come embracing you. I took those words with me. And that was the beginning of the birth of the new Africa Foundation. That wasn't the name then, but we were givers. So we have been givers for three decades, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. But I thought that having a foundation was just about giving. As it was growing, I realized that it's also about being responsible for the society you belong to. And that's how today we're sitting here. Seven months ago, I decided that the greatest voices in Africa should come together and start to speak for how Africa should be governed by Africans and not foreigners and not other people who are interested in whatever resources that we have in our countries. But we should be responsible for our own human resource and mineral resources. And the only way to do that is to industrialize our people and our minerals. So I want to use this moment to first of all thank all of you to accept this invitation. Who would I, how would I have thought of myself that coming from a farmland, a six-year-old boy that didn't have anything, would one day call upon people like you and you accept my invitation? A young man like me and people that can birth me, people that can be my aunties, my uncles, my leaders, my presidents. But you listen to the voice of the young man and you came here to speak to the youth and the people of Africa. They say the greatest creation or the most pinnacle creation is the human's mind and it must be used for a good purpose. Africa is lacking education, but not the type of education like Doctor was talking about. The sort of education that should come from our own. How to learn about our own resources. How to know to add value to our people. When you take value away from people, you stop the economy of your own country. You stop the growth of your own country. When you add value to the people, the country starts to grow. And Africa is about to grow because we are ready to add value to humanity, to the people who are Africans. So the purpose of New Africa is not only to give you food, is not only to organize a convention for us to meet and give you knowledge, but it's also to stand up and become responsible for the social responsibilities of this continent that will build the youth for the future of Africa is in the hands of the youth. They have more years ahead of them. And at least we have lived half through uh, our lifetime and some of us have even gone past that, but we thank God for giving us life. And we need to think about our children. We need to think about the youth who are coming up. So again, when I look at this opportunity, I don't take it lightly. You might call it a failure. I see it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Being here and being with us is four different leaders from four different sides of Africa coming to Ghana makes me feel that this is the headquarters of Africa. People have value for Ghana. They have value for Accra. When I was growing up, one of my favorite mentors was Kwame Nkrumah, and I had to find out the true story about him. His mother used to cross a river to go to the farm, and one day in the river, his mother had stepped on a fish, and he pointed the fish and said, Mama, you're standing on a fish. So the mother dipped the hand in the water, picked the fish, and they said that was illegal according to the tradition of the Enzimas. So they took the fish and Kwame Nkrumah to the palace. And the chief, the king said, who found the fish? And the woman said, my son. And the king said to the woman, cook the fish for your son to eat. Now the point that I'm trying to make is that Kwame Nkrumah was ordained. 
he was already ordained and we couldn't change that. Patrice Lumumba is ordained. Dr. Arikana is ordained. Peter Obi is ordained. We need to start to respect ordination. Our leaders are ordained for a reason. Who would have thought that kid at the back of the woman one day will have the whole world talking about him, about the changes that he wanted to bring in Africa? The leaders of Africa, I would like to use this moment to urge that please look into your youth. You have the Nkrumahs in there. You have the Marcus Garvey's in there. You have the Martin Luther's in there. You have great leaders in the youth. Give them the chance. Let them just help. Let them add value to the people. Let them support us. Let's support ourselves. Let's build ourselves again. And on this note, I would like to say sorry to those that couldn't participate with us in the convention. But right here, I am seeing the convention. This is the convention. This is the birth of the convention. This is the convention. So I would say that we probably would choose another African country one of these days and still spread the word of the convention. Because today marks a constitutional day in our country. And I believe that new Africa is born again here. And the convention has sparked from here. So I would like to encourage all of you to believe in this convention that the voices of Africa is being ignited for the right reasons. And thank you very much. And thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I feel very strongly that I should uh, make this comment. As I was uh, coming here, I got a call from one of my African diaspora who is uh, a Ghanaian who actually came to Ghana from the United States because I was coming here. He said, Ambassador, I heard a rumor that the reason uh, the event was canceled is because uh, the young man who uh, was sponsoring it is a, is a millionaire and he has uh, uh, political ambitions. And I said, well, that's news to me. So I felt I should address this in case some of you journalists may have heard that as well. I can tell you as clearly and plainly as I can that I never heard the conversation about him being a millionaire. I never had a conversation about him having political ambitions. The time that I've spent with him has been more to do with entrepreneurship mm -hmm. yeah. and the possibilities. So for those who are saying we are here to support him, uh, further his political ambitions, that is a damn lie. Certainly from my interactions with him, I don't know about whether he told Professor that. I don't know if he told uh, my brother, Honorable Peter, that. I might want them to clearly state that, whether that conversation ever took place. But the interactions I've had with Nana Bediago have been about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and the possibilities of what we can do if the African youth could be empowered mm -hmm. and how we can raise money to support African youth so they can build the Africa that we want. Mm -hmm. That's all the conversations I've had. Anything else, I do not know. But I felt I should let all of you journalists know, because I'm sure you're going to hear the same rumor that I just heard. These are the conversations I've had with my son. And I'll tell you one more thing. When the invitation came, Professor can tell you, I didn't know my son, but I had to do homework. What got me to accept the invitation is his age and the fact that he's a youth. Mm. If we do not support our youth,
then who is going to support them? I hired a young man one time, he said, doctor, nobody wants to hire me because I have no experience. But how do I get experience if I don't get a job to begin with? Yes. I said, son, you're hired. I accepted an invitation from Nana, not because I knew him, but because of his age and the amazing things that he's doing at such a young age. It is that plain and simple. Anything else is a lie. I just wanted to clear that up. I think I'll join um, in what uh, she said. You're very correct. It is about her entrepreneurship. I met him again by on the fourth, because <laughs> Prof who invited me, and uh, I got a call from him, and he said, he's around somewhere in Lagos. Can he come and visit me? I said, no, I'll come and visit you. And he was something about age. He said, since you're thinking about this, I'll come and visit you. And surprisingly, on arrival in Accra today, a young lady came along and said, I work with the youth and entrepreneurship. And I want you to talk or help talk about entrepreneurship. I said, we're coming to Ghana to talk about entrepreneurship. And you just asked me a question. How do we spark entrepreneurship among the youth in Africa? I say, fight one thing, corruption. Mm. And you look at me. Mm. I say, corruption kills three things that makes a society. It kills entrepreneurship. Nobody thinks in a corrupt mm. country mm. because there's easy money to make, <laughs> but still, it kills professionalism. Mm. So you don't have professors doing research any longer mm. because people are still in public money and it kills hard work. So fight it and you spark entrepreneurship. Mm. So it is about entrepreneurship. But let me add, there's nothing wrong mm. if you have an ambition. Thank you. I was, the, I was the trader. I was a banker. But I had a, somewhere along the line, something happened in my state. Where children did not go to school for two years. And I asked myself, why should I be making money when there's no future for these children? And that's where I'm in Nigeria today. I'm not desperate to be president of Nigeria. I'm desperate to see a Nigerian at work mm. for the future of my children, for the future of the children of Nigeria. I'm desperate to see how we can pull millions of people out of poverty in a country, God bless, with everything. We have vast, uncultivated land in Nigeria, and people are hungry to just close and give you an example of what we are suffering in our country. A country like Netherlands. Mm. In one year, did the export of $120 billion export of agricultural products. Netherlands without water, with water, is 43,000 square kilometers. Without water, it's 33. One state in Nigeria is more arable than Netherlands, mm. and that state has 76.3 thousand square kilometers of land. So it's two and a half times the land. Mm. That state is occupied by criminals today. <laughs> because that state cannot generate 1% of what the land can do with agriculture. And they have two and a half times the size of their land. Just one state. It cannot continue. We must change it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you very much. Ambition. Thank you. I can't agree more. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody should ever apologize for their desire to serve their mm. people. Thank you. Thank you. A mother's wisdom would always set the stage, <laughs> but the courage from Mr. Peter will be today yeah. as also, what could have been better than this conversation anywhere? Yeah. This, is, this is the conversation. This is the conversation. It couldn't have been better. Thank God it was canceled. Thank God we're having it here. And we'll look back many years and we'll be able to say, thank God the conversation happened.
I, I want to ask you to just, because this is also very tactical and very good in time and history, just a remark in response before we take this to a close. If you think this is beautiful, put your hands together, come on. I think these responses are just completely out of the box from Dr. Arikana and Mr. Peter B. I mean, this is just unbelievable, but this is the conversation. Wisdom. Thank you very much. In 21 years of my life, I have been serving a nation, working so hard just to become an example of what wealth looks like. And building wealth comes from knowledge, comes from wisdom, comes from understanding. You need to get this value from your own surroundings. I grew up partly in Ghana, partly in England, and I came back to Africa. 2001, unlike Martin Luther, I did not have a dream. I had a vision. I started watching the youth and the streets and the roads the rules and the regulations, the conditions and the constitutions that is stipulated and embedded on us as Africans. I had to walk on a different path and I was alone. My investment on the roads became a landmark. And whatever I invested on this landmark is a footprint. I am here for a legacy. I am part of your historians. That I know many people want to see the true side of me. I know you know Nana Kwame Bediako, but I know you're still looking for freedom, Jacob Caesar. Yes, I am red christened and I'm here. I'm not here to take your value. I'm here to add value to you. I discovered that the land that we belong to had so much wealth that until we turn it into our own, our economy will never be sustainable. And we cannot forever leave live in our countries with a box economy. I needed to create a middle income economy without being a part of the government. Why so? Because I believe it's part of my responsibility. I took a different path. My movements, my foundation, my groups, and all of this have acquired some wealth. But the wealth that I reimbursed back into society, it has become a part of my mission to make this change. I believe that I belong to Africa. I am a son of this soil. And I can add value to humanity. And I came here to do that. I came here to add value to this world and to nature. I am not going to live here without God even being proud of me. And when I'm not here also, I want you to remember that I came. And I want my absence to be felt. And for that reason, I know you're looking for the man. And a man in a mask is sitting in front of you. What's up? What's up? Thank you. I am nothing to be scared of. I came to you as your salvation. I don't invest in myself alone. I am investing in you. And truly, these innocent leaders sitting beside me, of course I will not go to them and tell them that, hey, I am a man in a mask and I want you to come to Ghana to support me to do this and this. And this man of this dignity and this woman with such power will say, yes, I'm going to follow you to come to Ghana to do your convention and all of that. No. It is part of the movement. We need to educate we need to uplift our children. We need to voice out to them. If you are about to find out about this man in the mask, because I never spoke a word, you were looking for me. I didn't tell you whether I am into politics, whether I am an evangelist, whether I am a conventionist or a revolutionist. After this day, you will have to wait for me to share my policies and my visions with you. And if I'm the reason why the country or the government is not happy about these great voices coming to educate not only Ghana, but also Africa, then I take this moment to sacrifice myself, to unveil myself, because I have much respect 
for these great leaders beside me. It would have taken my own time to tell you that I am. But for this very moment, I am sacrificing myself to let you know that I'm that man. But I'm that man with a good purpose, with a great vision. I have a plan and I have a vision for this nation. And not only this nation, I have it for Africa too. But I know Africa is the next biggest thing because out of all the continents that have been developed in this world, there is only one continent that is not developed. And I am sent to do that. I am not interested in people's positions. I am not interested in presidential positions. I am interested in the regions and the humans. I am interested in the countries. I am interested in the continent. The resources here, the human resources here, the great opportunities to be able to prove a point to the world that this is what we can make out of ourselves as a black society. We have been doomed and disrespected and devalued by everybody in the Western world. My pain is in my heart and I can't express it to you. So I let my actions speak for me. I want to thank you very much for this moment. And I want to thank mm. greatest leaders. Your voice would not, will never leave us as Africans. Mm. And it's the beginning of a new Africa, a new nation, a new dawn, a new mindset. Everything is new. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, don't, we, we won't take any question, but I can tell you, and I want to openly thank Mr. Peter B for taking a chunk of young leaders from Nigeria to come over here, including myself. Mm. You know, I can tell you that we will support you from Nigeria. Thank you. South Africa will support you. Different part of Africa is going to support you. Like Mr. Peter Obi says, when we find vision, we will do everything to ensure that vision is lifted in Africa. As individuals, we can be anything, anywhere. If you're talking about the latest car developed today and designed in Nigeria, it's sitting there. We have Okonji Awala. We have all kinds of people. Eme Gualias, we've develop things that can help do anything. But the only reason keeping Africa down is that we don't have a power nation. The young man Maxwell from Zimbabwe who created, I call it Max Energy because that's his name. Mm. They sent scientists from Europe, they came and validated yet they, I mean, it's almost, England is what it is because of our scientists. Israel is what it is because of our scientists. Same with America. On the strength of this man's invention, Africa should be on but on whose shoulder? Because Nigeria is groveling. There is no power nation on which these individuals are going to sit. I want to say to you, mentors, that we see, as young people, I'm standing by him to say, we see that very clearly. We, 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 we own the vision. And upon this foundation, Africa will be built. Thank you. Rise to your feet. So finally, we know the man behind the mask of the new force, and his name is Nana Bediako, or Nana Kwame Bediako, as he's introduced himself. And in the midst of this unexpected cancellation of the new Africa Convention at the Independence Square, the leaders resorted to a press conference from a base in Cantonment here in Accra to drum home their concerns. I mean, we heard from Dr. Arikana Kwa of Zimbabwe, Professor P.L.O. Lumumba, lawyer and activist, and also Nigeria's Peter Obi, and of course, the man behind the mask, Nana Kwame Bediako. Um, he's also with the New Africa Foundation. And they are all gunning for a purposeful leadership in Africa and urging the youth to find their voice.
But the question still remains, why the sudden cancellation? Well, from us here at the Joy Newsroom, we say thank you for staying with us. Have a good evening.